<laughs> wow, this is uh, a little bit more than what I thought it was going to be. This is way more than I expected it to be. <laughs> That's why I was like, oh, are we in the right place? <laughs> I know, I was like, this is my intervention. I know it is. <laughs> is that my mother over there? I, Brian, I love you to death. But your obsession with drink has gotten too far. <laughs> well, I tell you what, King off with an obvious question. Talking about love, why do you think there is still... All these years later, about love. yeah, talking about love. That's a good segue. Why is there so much love for this very little but very beautiful piece of cinema you guys made? Um, I said this earlier in the uh, the Q and A that we did. Um, the great thing about the the first film, Clerks, uh, was that Kevin was able to capture yeah. what he was living, uh, working a retail job in a local community, you know, convenience store, and. Um, being, and it's now becoming a trend, especially the last 20 years, being overeducated and unemployed and not having the proper kind of jobs that fill the education you want to get uh, is, is a draining thing. And it's, uh, society is doing it a lot these days. There's a lot of people who have great education and loads of education and debt, uh, student loan debt, that the jobs aren't there. And so he took it in a very microcosm way, it's just a convenience store clerk wanting to do a better thing, station in life, having his friend who's happy with his station in life at that time and just poking a finger in the eye of things and observations that he has. So you've either worked at a very crappy retail job or you've been in a store where the, the attendants there were really crappy at their job. So it relates to you either as a customer or as an employee. And the success that Kevin has had with his uh, succeeding films afterwards has kept his work in the limelight for so long. And, and the fact that we've had uh, careers for 25 years in this industry is testament to how uh, just uh, writing what you know and uh, writing what you love um, and sticking to you, be, be you. Don't try to be what, they, what you think people want of you, but just write for you, make for you, make the film you want to tell, not what you think the people want to see. You'll find your audience and your audience will support you going like, yeah, man, I'm Silent Bob or yeah, man, I'm that that weak willed Dante Hicks or hey, man, I'm that foul mouth, you know, Randall spitting water at life kind of guy. So there's characters for everybody in the film that I think people yeah. can relate to. That's the 15 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Don't all answer it. There you go. In the back. Okay. Um, uh, for, you inspired a lot of people in the films, especially the people going into the business, acting and such. What would your, like the characters and expression, what, what's your advice to anyone in the business who wants to be in the business and come through? Train and know the reasons why they want it because that is. I've come across very many people who they just want to be rich and famous, and that's so not the reason to be in this business. <laughs> Kim <Kardashian>. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's not going to happen that quickly, and you may or may not get rich and famous. And uh, it's 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 the passion that's going to keep driving to do it over and over. I mean, and I've I've had especially the last year for me has been very difficult, uh, just living. And I, I've had to kind of reassess. It's like, do I go out and find a nine to five job? Um, but if I do that, I can't, I cannot give it up. I can't. And it's like, I really was in that position where it's like, I can't do that. So it's like the passion just keeps on driving it. Scott? Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's all passion and I believe that in the arts, it kind of chooses you. You don't choose it because I, somebody told me a piece of a uh, nugget years ago about if you think you can be happy doing anything else, go do it. But if you believe this is really for you, then strap in and realize it's going to be, you know, a lot of hard knocks, but you have to have the passion for it. It's that simple. Um, you know, I had a high school drama teacher that told me, you know, don't even think of it uh, after my first audition. He's like, you know, uh, and I was stage manager. 
but I had such passion and such desire and probably at that point, just a lot more nerve to just keep going. And luckily I found some great training and I hit an age where it began to work out a little better and I was doing better at it. But I don't think that you can, it's like anything that somebody's naturally born to do or want to do, you know, it's in you. It's hard to walk away from it. Like she's saying, you don't want mm -hmm. to. And I would say, um, you know, especially on the acting end, you should be able to hear the word no 85% of the time. And the no isn't because you suck. The no isn't because you can't do what they're asking you to do. The no a lot of time, especially in television and film, is you're not the right physical type we're looking for. You're not the right ethno type we're looking for. You're not the right, oh, we have so-and-so cast already, and I just don't see the two of you being a chemistry kind of thing, you know. Uh, I get the question all the time, like, how was it working with Rosario Dawson? Because films wouldn't pair us two together normally in Hollywood. But we did it. The Kevin thought to do it in this. And as much as the character is a hideous fucking shot, as he likes to say, <laughs> um, it worked. The chemistry, you kind of see why the chemistry worked with those two characters. And then as an actor going through the training, I started in theater I did theater for quite a few years before even auditioning uh, for my first film, which was Clerks, the original Clerks. Um, it is having that passion, but also uh, being considerate to everybody who's involved in the project. There is no one who I don't ask, hey, what's your name? And, and, and there's no one who I go like, I want my coffee. Where's that boy? My coffee. Oh, there's too much sugar in this. You know, I'm not I've never been that way in my life ever. And people are like, wow, you're so cool and so nice. Uh, I want to thank you for being there. I'm like, don't thank me. Thank my parents. I was brought up in an Irish Catholic household. My parents and my two older brothers, all born in Ireland, in Galway, the West Coast. They emigrated to New York City in 65, and then I was born in 69. And then we holidayed back in Galway, and then I'd visit family up in Birmingham or in London. I'm, after this weekend, I'm going down to Hythe to visit my aunt. My mother's already down there because she flew in with me, and we're going to have family get-togethers. But it's that kind of upbringing that kept me on the straight and narrow, and having friends keeping me grounded. grounded. And I was, a, I was a huge, I'm a new, still a huge uber nerd, so I did <laughs> table gaming and role-play gaming, and it was the role play gaming that kept me sane and off the streets of keeping getting into trouble and my father passed away when I was 15 years old so that was the kind of thing that got me grounded I I left the real world to get into fantasy world and doing D&D &D and all these other gamings which that's why nerd culture and these cons I completely am right in that same vein and I'm proud of it too you know mutant and proud well I'm nerd and proud so it's, it's the same thing um, and I don't deny it and I don't deny it this has always been, I was just talking to someone about this, so I would say, cons are a safe space. There's no one who comes in here and we judge them. Yeah, we have cosplay costumes, but they're, they knew they were getting into a contest, so we're judging them. <laughs> but there's no judging. You could be whatever character you want to be. You can think about, you can have fandom about anything. You can hear the occasional Star Wars, Star Trek argument about which is better, or Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, or whatever you have it. But we're all that community of nerds, which that's why I love about it. All the politics that happen outside, all the world events, all the horrors that are happening, natural and man-made, end when you walk through these convention doors. And people go like, oh, are you sick of doing conventions and hearing people go, hey, you were supposed to be here today? No, I love it. <laughs> because we're all here for the same reason, with the love of art. We're all part of artists. Yeah. Comic books are arts. Like in America, I always talk about funding the schools, funding the arts. We're all cutting these programs to fund sports. Sports, great, great, great thing to have kids do, get outdoors, be involved. But artists... We all got dressed today. You may not all be artists at all, but when you got dressed today and you went to your closet, you took out your drawer and you saw your shirts, you picked this color because it went with this pants to what with that shoe. That's an artistic choice. That was taught to you, color, shapes, and coordination. So I get passionate about it because I don't want to see the arts die. So that's my little spiel on the arts. <laughs> and being an actor from your question. Mm -hmm. Talking about passion, obviously, um, fans have so much passion for the moments on screen in Clerks, particularly the first film. I'm curious, though, when you look back at events like this and get together, are there particular organic memories, things from set, um, stories that fans perhaps don't know that make you smile the most or, or you think are the most poignant? Uh, it, it's, 
a lot of it is actually starting to kind of get fuzzy a little bit. Um, and I, I'm one of those triggered memory type of people. So it's like all of a sudden we'll just kind of be talking about something and then it's like, oh, yeah, I remember that. And But, I mean, it's it's always a fond memory. Um, and one thing, too, that, that people ask me is, like, what was it like working on there? And, and the, the best way that I could put it is, like, it's, you know, when it's your first experience working on a movie set, you won't have that feeling, that experience again. What I did say is like, well, maybe, you know, if I was working on a major motion picture, it might be close to it, but not exactly. Um, it's like, like he said, I come from theater as well. We, we did theater together before we were in Clerks. And so that also, it's, it's, it's a whole different type of feeling and experience. But just, oops, sorry. Um, I, I think, and the way that I put it is like, we were all in the same boat together, experiencing something for the first time and, you know, translating from the stage to, to the, to film. Um, so it, it, those are my experiences, my moments, my memories. Scott? Well, other than almost getting arrested before my audition, <laughs> <laughs> that, that story's on the IMDb. That's true. Um, that's a pretty crazy memory that I didn't really get to share with anybody because I didn't want anybody to know back then because I didn't want to cast a uh, negative uh, dispersion on myself. But uh, I got to the audition very early. It was at a short town, uh, the Atlantic Highlands Theater there. And I went out on a jetty on the beach and it was closed and I was getting ready for the audition and gesturing wildly and doing my thing. And from the shore, it must have looked like there was a lunatic out on the jetty. They thought I was inebriated or whatnot, or maybe suicidal. And I said, well, listen, if, if you're going to arrest me, can you do it after the audition, please? And they're like, well, this, you know, obviously there's nothing wrong with this guy. He's just a little, uh, maybe a little too passionate about what he's doing. But uh, <laughs> and, this that's not, what, and this is 93 before Bluetooth earpieces. Yeah. Where you yeah. just see someone talking. To them, right. Oh, he's now he's earpiece, probably right? on a phone or whatever. But uh, <laughs> that's a pretty wild memory for me. And it, it's, it's a good one, too, because I'm also uh, sober from uh, some pretty, pretty brutal alcoholism days. And back then I was suffering with it pretty badly. So to look back at that now and to the, the uh, there's a lot of levity in that story for me now. For me, the, the memories of just uh, the first of experience of the shooting a film with a bunch of people, we all had regular daytime jobs. We do our nine to five job. I'd go home from where my daytime job was. I'd sleep, try to get some sleep from like five o'clock in the afternoon until 930 at night. Get up, uh, shower, shit, shave, get out there and grab something to eat. Get down an hour south from where I live to get to the store, get ready and make up. And uh, we'd close the store at like around 1030 at night, 11 o'clock, and then shoot from like 11 o'clock at night till about 536 a.m. Doing scenes and then put, take out all the equipment, which wasn't much, but take most of the equipment out of the convenience store over bring it over to the video store because the video store wouldn't open until like 11 o'clock and then uh start it all over again go back i'd work nine to five at that mm -hmm. job and go home and do it and we did that for 22 23 days or so and uh those memories and that grind um and then being accepted to the new york feature film market which is a film festival that doesn't even exist anymore for the first mm -hmm. screening and having 24 people in the audience 12 of which was like us uh, but luckily, on a Sunday, the last Sunday of the festival at 11 a.m., it was, you know, we were like it was like the death uh, slot for for films. But thankfully, we had a great angel in our audience by the name of Mr. Bob Hawk, uh, who saw the film and was a, uh, a person who influenced uh, a lot of filmmakers and recommended it to the Sundance Film Festival. And then that's where the spark started to grow. And to think that I thought I'd just have a VHS copy of the film for friends to goof around about and like, well, look at this goofy thing that we did. And for your audiences that don't know what VHS is, ask your grandparents. What <laughs> um, to, to now see that here we are 20 going on a 25th anniversary kind of feel about it. And uh, the subsequent films that followed and being a part of those films and seeing where these characters went, like the Dante and Randall character in Clerks 2, and we did the cartoon series, which was one of the fun childhood dreams of my life was to be a part of a, a, a cartoon, is undeniably a, an incredible blessing that I'll always be grateful for. And to see that people like yourselves, this room is full of people who are artists themselves, who are writers themselves, who take themselves seriously in what they do and enjoy what we do is, is a great blessing. And 
we're humbled and honored that people still want to see these things. And we're uh, happily anticipating the reaction of the fan base because now we are at the age where people of our age who had kids, now their kids are old enough to see this movie properly without embarrassment <laughs> and see the other Kevin Smith films without embarrassment and love it and enjoy it. There's many cons where families will come where a father will bring a son like, my son loves that whole donkey scene and <laughs> stuff like that where it's like, uh, it's kind of awkward, you know? <laughs> An African-American fan coming up going like, that porch monkey scene, I'm like, uh, is awesome. Like, <laughs> good to hear, thanks. Um, it's kind of cool and, you know, the the... The everyday man kind of feel that Kevin has with his writing makes the audience feel comfortable with us immediately. There's no like, oh, my God, it's Sir Richard Attenborough. Oh, and you want to be proper with them or Anthony Hopkins. Which is like, hey, what's up, Dante? You know, they're, they're already comfortable to scream at us across the room, <laughs> which is kind of nice that we have that comfortable feel with it. Plus, I get it. I have a comfortable way of just poking fun and taking the piss out of them as well. So it's that kind of give and take that I've always enjoyed with an audience that we've always enjoyed with an audience that uh, makes this fan base and makes that, once again, why is it relative and, and, and uh, still relevant to now is that kind of feel. It's pretty amazing dynamic because no matter how crude some of the humor gets, there's so much heart mm -hmm. that you can't help but embrace it and love it. I mean, my mom, God bless her, I miss her. She would be in tears over Jay and Bob, no matter how filthy Jay got. And I could, I would, I couldn't get over that she wasn't like blown out by the language and some of the real, you know, some of it's quite crude. Especially the first film is pretty filthy, but there's so much heart that comes through somehow. Amazing, amazing dynamic. Hey guys, last question. Good one. Um, so, what can we look forward to in the upcoming months and more acts too? Um, I just uh, recently said this in an interview that, you know, uh, after seeing Endgame and seeing the culmination of these 22 films coming together, I'm seeing without some, you know, uh, Iron Man kind of event. And no, I'm not spoiling it. Um, the culmination of all of Kevin's View Askew films coming together with this Jay and Bob. I'm not saying this is our last View Askew film. And by any means. Um, but it, it had that kind of feel in, in reading it and then seeing the amount of people that got on board to be a part of it. Now, Kevin's been posting on his Instagram and his Facebook and his Twitter accounts different shots from the set with different people from cameos of the previous films and new cameos, for that matter. And people and fans and I'd read comments like, why are you telling us all this? You're spoiling it and blah, blah, blah. It's not even a third of who's in this film. <laughs> I would sit there on set and scenes and be like, I can't believe blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah are on this set right now. <laughs> That's a highly insult to Mr. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Blah, blah, blah. No, but I mean, it's that kind of thing where it's like, God, this is a this is going to be re I just, you know, I can't wait for the fall to come around. I think he's going to be, I believe he's working on a trailer to hopefully be seen at uh, San Diego. So hopefully San Diego will be a, a trailer release and then a, hopefully a fall release. Now, he that's nothing new in the press. He said that it's probably a fall release. So I know he's working on it now. I know he's been reaching out to different bands to do the soundtrack. So he's in that stage of the thing. Look, we're not a heavy special effects film, so it's not like, well, we got two years of 15 houses putting special effects on Jay's bong smoke. So um, once the, the film is at Kevin and Kevin edits while we film. Yeah. So literally the three days prior, he's on his laptop and he's 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 uh, and the technology's gotten so small too, but he's uh, he's doing it and he's a. Uh, in the process of working on other projects and hopefully with the success of the Jay and Bob movie that that'll spur the other movies that we're thinking about bringing out for the views. You know? I heard you say more acts too. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Last question. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very much.